The Tom Woods Show, episode 2142. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level, Tom Woods, is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught, with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to welcome back our old friend, Tho Bishop, assistant editor over at the Mises Wire at the Mises Institute, Mises.org. But more than that, he is an idea ambassador. He's a guy who takes ideas that need to be heard and that likely will be well-received by certain groups, but those groups never get to hear those ideas for a variety of reasons. And so Tho is able to take radical Austrian, let's say Austro-libertarian ideas, particularly about money, but also on other topics, and bring them to a crowd that may agree with him in principle about private property and the free enterprise economy and all that, but they've just never heard anything beyond platitudes. And they certainly haven't heard any really challenging ideas about institutions that define the regime, like the Federal Reserve System, for example. And apparently, Tho did precisely this over the weekend at a conference we're going to talk about. And I want to know exactly the kinds of things he said to that audience that is ripe for a message like this. These are conservatives who are not part of Conservatism, Inc. Conservatism, Inc. is hopeless. But when you operate outside of Conservatism, Inc., well, there's a chance that we might be able to sit down together and talk. By the way, same goes for the left. If you're outside of left-wingism, Inc., there's a chance we can talk about some topics. We all know Jimmy Dore, for example. You can talk to him about some topics. But I think, frankly, there are more people on this side of the aisle, so to speak, who are going to be receptive to the big ideas that we do have. And Tho is really great at connecting with them. So, Tho, welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Tom. All right. I follow you on Twitter. I saw what you did. I didn't look into it in too much detail because I thought that would spoil the fun. So I want to talk to you right now. You spoke at an event over the weekend where you appeared alongside some people, folks who listen to this show would have heard of, and even people who don't would have heard of. And you gave a presentation that I think probably filled a gap at an event like that. And yet, it's the kind, I'm teasing them so much with this ridiculously long preface here, but, but it's the kind of topic that once they hear you talk about it, they think, yeah, of course I agree with this guy, but if you hadn't done it, I bet nobody would have. So you are a critical ambassador of Misesian ideas into a world, an ideological world that is prepared to receive them if only someone will deliver them. Do you think that's an accurate overview of what just happened? Well, I I appreciate those kind words. It's quite the hype right there. I I do appreciate it. It was exciting to see the response from a fairly traditional conservative audience. And the event was AmpFest West. It's a group of American priorities. They've been doing events historically in Florida, but this is the first time they were out on the West Coast. So they had Larry Elder there. They had Corey DeAngelis there. So it it was a great lineup. And the talk that I gave was about money and the state. And, you know, more importantly, kind of just a recognition that there's an awakening, I think, on the right about how illegitimate the regime is, either from the election aspect with Biden, or you look at all these lizard people at Davos, and you kind of recognize that these people do not have our interest in mind. And what I was trying to do is connect that anger. And I think it's been a positive development the degree to which kind of the cynicism that the right has for our global elites now but you know, it's not enough to simply recognize that these are bad actors. We have to identify why do these people have the power they have? And a big part of that is the role that central banks, the Fed, play in subsidizing their power over us. And that ultimately, money is not simply a nerdy, libertarian, you know, econ, theoretical issue. That fundamentally, this is about giving power to our enemies at the expense of us, and then also the way that it impoverishes families and our ability to you know, provide for our children and to help even our, our grandchildren and beyond. It was very encouraging to see that sort of talk had just a, a fantastic response out there. By the way, just so I can get a sense of the depth you must have gone into, how long did you talk? It was about a half hour talk. 
Okay, good, good, good. That's actually pretty good because you're still within the range of a normal person's attention span. So that's actually pretty good. How did you get invited? Well, I've been doing some work with a group called Americans for National Renewal. They've endorsed some candidates out there like Blake Masters and, and a few other kind of the, the Republicans that I think are kind of improving the quality a little bit on the American right. And so a connection there helped connect me with the event organizers. And again, it was, it was a wonderful event. First time I'd ever been out to Palm Springs. You know, usually I don't leave Florida for California, but I'm glad I went out there. Also glad I didn't have to fill up a gas tank out there because uh, many stations over $6. So uh, yeah, was, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I keep hearing about that. It's interesting, by the way, that these kinds of meetings that they're having, you know, the global elites have their meetings and belong to these various associations and stuff. And usually it's a handful of people who cover what it is they're doing. And the mainstream just ignores it completely, like it's not even happening. Mm. And suddenly, suddenly there is huge attention being paid in the mainstream, and in particular the mainstream right, are suddenly reporting on it like crazy. And so I think COVID helped to drive this because all of a sudden, yeah, you know, these people will meet in Switzerland and they'll talk about they want to have a global tax on X or Y and it never comes to pass and you know nothing really comes of it. But it's still pretty sinister, <laughs> these people getting together, planning what they'd like to do to us. But I think it became reality for people when they saw that these are the kind of people urging governments to keep us in our homes, to force us to get injected, to do all these things that obviously no impartial look at the science could justify. So something sinister is going on. There's suddenly all this attention paid. I think that was driven because of COVID. That now that COVID's passed, there's some toothpaste that's out of the tube that's never going back in. That's my thinking about it. I agree entirely. I think COVID, the mass dropped so far in such a vivid way. Yeah. It's something, I mean, it affected every single person on a daily basis, right? And, and I think it's interesting the degree to which how blatant the collusion was between government officials on an international scale, the various NGO sort of organizations pushing the line, you know, when the WHO is out there pushing just information that people just knew what was wrong and politically manipulated. And then the degree to which, you know, kind of normal people, right? You know, these are not people that grew up with a great distrust of elites of the state, kind of recognizing their gut that someone like even like Bill Gates not only doesn't have their best interests at heart, but actually has more power over them than, you know, their congressman or their state rep. And I think this has created a very, it's perhaps more instinctual than it is intellectual for many of these people, but there's something in their gut that knows that something's not right. And I think that is fueling a lot of the political trends, not only in the US, but on a broader scale. And it's something that for those of us who hate the regime, I look at it as a land of opportunity on getting them to connect this anger with the substantive stuff and ultimately, if there's one concern I have about where the right is going, there can be a hostility to economics. And I get that in a certain sense, right? When you have Janet Yellen, who should be, based off her CV, the leading economic expert in the US, getting things you know, absolutely wrong. And when you get a lot of DC think tank people, the ones that talk most about free markets, seeming to be absolute, just shameless defenders of really bad corporate stuff... I can understand why that provokes a cynicism about what economics really offers them. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the content that you provide, that the Mises Institute provides. I think we hit at that axis of populist distrust of the regime and still that strong free market defense that's so important. And ultimately, this is really about preserving civilization and really promoting civic virtue more so than perhaps some of the materialistic defenses that are very popular with other orbits. And I think that's why that sort of message kind of, I think, can resonate with some Tucker Carlson audience type people out there. Yeah, who do need to hear it? Because it's understandable, as you say, that somebody looking around, surveying the people who are supposed to be the top thinkers in economics and listening to what they say, you might well conclude this is a fake discipline. This is not real. This is just cover for people to impose the kinds of policies that benefit them that they want to see. This, this is not scientific. And so for you to show up and explain what's really happening and actually reflect 
frankly, real economics. Well, that needs to be heard. And that needs to be done. I have a ebook, of course, because what else, right? I have an ebook called Our Enemy, the Fed, that I kind of intended to be for somebody who doesn't really know anything about it, but who's heard about it, wants to know a little bit more, and to try to answer some of the common arguments that, well, you know, now we don't have as many recessions and things are milder now than they used to be. We don't have these wild swings and all that sort of thing. I, I answer that. So anybody interested in that, that's actually at Our Enemy, the Fed. Dot com. I was very glad to buy that particular domain name. So how do you, first of all, how do you broach this topic? How do you introduce this to people? Because I think we've all been led to believe that economics is boring and it's not as fun as talking about critical race theory and drag queen story hour or whatever. So how do you do the rhetorical equivalent of grabbing them by the collar? Well, first, yeah, I, I kind of lean into the anger that's already there and then identify like, you know, when we think about money creation, and when we think about what the Fed is doing, it's not simply $6 gasoline and our paychecks going down, which again, I think this is one of the biggest changes the last year and a half on this issue is that while your audience will understand that we were made poorer than we otherwise would have been because of the Fed's insanity after 2008, it's harder to see that unseen aspect there. But when it's something so visual now, like this is the number one political issue in America. It's the number one kitchen table issue. You know, that anger's already there. And one of the things I try to emphasize is that it's not only that they are making you poorer, that they're taking that money and giving it to the enemy, right? If you are concerned about woke academia and the deep state and, you know, big tech, well, guess what? The other side of your paycheck going less than it was a year ago is that these actors are the ones benefiting, right? It is woke academia benefiting from the state being able to use inflation as a silent tax, right? Big tech consolidation has been a large part subsidized by monetary policy and kind of the financial regime of post-2008 global order. And so therefore, if you have concerns about the way that they're manipulating their market share, you know, this goes back to a Fed issue. And then also you have the additional dynamic made very vivid during the Canadian trucker convoy that comes up, you know, it seems every month there's some debanking story out there that not only are they robbing from you, not only are they rewarding your enemies, but then they are using the dollar as a weapon against you to debank critics of the regime without due process, to confiscate money given to people protesting for their freedoms. Those different angles are, it, it's, it's different than, you know, I'm not an economist, right? And so it's different than trying to break down the huge money supply charts and, and, and the great FRED data and the debt clock and these very big numbers that are very concerning. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but trying to highlight how all these other issues that they've had for a very long time are all connected back to this economic point, which is what has government done to our money? Tell people about your experience in D.C. because it also involved monetary issues. Yeah, so after the Tea Party took over in 2010, I was able to get a position with the Financial Services Committee with the Republican majority. My first chairman was Congressman Spencer Backus from Birmingham and then Jeff Hensling from Texas. And it was very interesting because, for one, you recognize just how little anyone in Congress cared about monetary policy, how little even the staff cares. Usually the, the staff was very interested in financial services issues, not because they had some sort of great intellectual crusade in mind, but because it was a very good way of getting a great K Street job, right? The more in the weeds you went in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac financial policy or regulations, right? Like those were good skills to have after you left the Hill, but there was just a complete disinterest in the Fed. It's, you know, whenever Bernanke came in, you were expected to bow down. And of course, being a Austrian mole within this, non-libertarian committee, the highlight of my time in D.C. was when I was working with, you know, Lydia Mashburn and Paul Martin Foss that were working for, you know, Ron Paul's office and trying to identify little ways where we could get a Mises article or a Zero Hedge article in front of members or trying to uh, elevate a Joe Salerno coming in for a hearing, right? It was kind of the behind-the-scenes maneuvering as a staff, as well as providing educational opportunities for staff members 
that some of the younger staff, like not the policy guys, the younger staff coming in, they were a lot more kind of interested in some of the, the Ron Paul stuff, some of the Fed stuff. And so behind the scenes, we were trying to uh, indoctrinate as many colleagues as possible into recognizing why Ron Paul talks about gold. So it, it was very interesting. It's encouraging just to see how I think that the emotional aspect, some of the you know, eyes are opening to why these issues matter, I think, a lot more. As much as I would like to believe that's because of some of the inroads we made back there, I recognize that, again, nothing does that quite like uh, $6 gasoline. Yes, exactly. Well, nothing gets people focused on business cycles like a housing crash. Right. I couldn't have written a book on Austrian economics in 2005 and had it be a New York Times bestseller. That only happened because everybody was wondering, what the hell just happened here? You know, I also, I personally have tried to reach some of the kind of folks you were talking to through my newsletter. The way I particularly reach them on issues like this is to say, all right, now that we've seen over the past couple of years, the whole COVID craziness, now we're going to take a step back. And I want you to look at who's been really, really good on this. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's been really, really good on it is Ron Paul. Now, his enemies will say, oh, Ron Paul, he won't listen to the experts. And doesn't he know that we should wear masks and this and that? Okay, so he gets all of that. But you know that these so-called experts have been refuted over and over to the point where it's an embarrassment now. And he was right. And all the people who laughed at him were wrong. Well, now, does that ring any bells about other issues he might have talked about in the past where we're all told we have to defer to the experts and there are people planning the money supply and you just, you don't need to worry your pretty little head about it. And then you had a Ron Paul standing up saying, on the House floor in 2001, as this dot-com bubble is bursting, they're now setting us up for a real estate bubble, which just as surely will burst. Nobody else was saying that on the House floor in 2001. So once again, the people whose judgment we're supposed to defer to once again is wrong. And this guy that all of us, including you in this audience, you were taught by the conservative establishment to laugh at him and dismiss him. Well, guess who was right again? So, and these two issues are central to your life. COVID involves whether you can move around or not. And money involves how you interact with other people, whether you can get the resources you need. And on both of these cases, we've got a lot of quacks who tell us the opposite of what we need to hear. And then the one honest man is the one who's ridiculed. So if you were part of that ridiculing team, I hope now you'll look back and say, oh man, boy, did they snooker me. I will never make that mistake again. And man, I owe him an apology. Now that maybe that's a little bit too direct and blunt, but I think it's what they need to hear. No, it's absolutely correct. People resonate, you know, when, when you can put a face to it, a personality to it, and a personality with a record, a face with a record, I do think that is very powerful with people. And, you know, on that point, it was very interesting how many people came up to me talking about Ron Paul. And some of it was, you know what, I used to think that Ron Paul guy was crazy, but after what I've seen the last 10 years, he was right on the money. Some of it was, you have a lot of people that are rising within you know, running for office and things like that, who were Ron Paul people. The leading attorney general candidate in Arizona, he was a very impressive speaker at the event. And he mentioned how he got his start in 2008 as a Ron Paul guy. I was talking with a uh, political consultant a few months ago, and he talked about how all the research they've done, the most powerful fundraising name that this campaign found was Rand Paul. And that's precisely because of his pushback to Fauci and the stands that he has taken. And there is, I think, a recognition among people who were Rick Santorum voters or Mitt Romney voters or even Newt Gingrich supporters back in 2008, 2012, that are far closer aligned to the Pauls now than they have been before. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm a little more optimistic than some on some of the political trends, particularly on the right. Why don't progressives run with this? Now, I know you can find people like Nomi Prince and the occasional odd progressive who is interested in the Fed, and they never get it quite right, but at least they know something's not quite right here. Whereas somebody like Rachel Maddow, she was making excuses for the bailouts. Well, the economy was going to disappear, or some ridiculous, what does that mean? Buying and selling was not going to happen anymore? What are you even talking about? So immediately, whatever the overlord said, she was just going to accept. And yet, 
progressives are supposed to be opposed to organized economic power and backdoor deals and bailouts and whatever. And yet when push comes to shove, they're just going to call you a conspiracy theorist if you want to talk to the Fed. What do you think's at work there? It's interesting because like there is there is an academic side on the left that does talk about how the Fed increases income inequality and some of their major issues. Karen Petro had a book published last year that Ryan McMakin has read. I, I have not. It's on my bookshelf in an ever-growing queue. But it's called Engine of Inequality, and it's a look at Fed policy. I didn't even know about yeah. that book. Interesting. And, and even there was a very fascinating history about really kind of focus on the Bernanke Fed, Lords of Easy Money. And that book was kind of one of those frustrating reads because the contemporary history, like the behind the scenes stuff was really good. And Thomas Honig looks really good in it because he was the lone dissenter to some of the really crazy Bernanke stuff. But then every time the author kind of chimed in with his own economic view, like it was just very cringy. It's like, oh, of course we have to have a central bank. It's crazy to think otherwise. But what Bernanke did was really bad. And it's like, okay, fine. I think one of the issues they struggle with, like there was, I think, a, a little bit a reevaluation of monetary policy, but it kind of went to the, even the crazier side of things, like the MMT stuff and things like that. And they were trying to focus on, okay, well, if the Fed is bad for building up corporate privilege or things like that, the answer is we need to be, you know, they need to be printing money and giving it to a whole bunch of nonprofits that we like because we're going to focus on diversity or or your reparations or things like that, right? You know, they don't have, you know, I've yet to see any sort of left-wing solution to perhaps more solid critiques of the Fed that don't end up simply saying, oh, well, obviously we need just, we need a more active Fed when it comes to monetary policy, right? You know, there's, there's a dynamic there that the closest thing you get is kind of the Jack Dorsey, neither left nor right tech bro type that likes to talk about Bitcoin as a non-politicized solution, which is is better than dismissing this sort of stuff, right? But I I think that itself, and I I think Jack Dorsey has been guilty of this on on a lot of fronts. I'm not trying to tick shots at him. I think there's worse people in the Silicon Valley orbit. The entire idea that you could promote something like Bitcoin and stay above politics or not get the target on your back from the regime fundamentally demonstrates, I think, an extreme naivete about, for one, the significance of money to the state's power, and two, just how serious they take this stuff. And when you see the desperate attempts to portray Bitcoin and other attempts at depoliticizing money as either representation of white supremacy or the greatest environmentalist threat of our times because of energy consumption or a dangerous national security threat because we can't track that money, right? There's so much hysteria on the crypto front, and I think in part driven by some of the concerns out there on the money, monetary side of things, that any of these people that try to think that they can still get along with the power brokers while pushing Bitcoin, I think they're going to find the next few years is not going to work out that well for them. All right, before I go on, let me remind you about an app that's going to make your life way better, that's going to make you well-informed in a short period of time. Sounds kind of like the Tom Woods show a little bit, doesn't it? But I'm talking about Blinkist, which takes all kinds of nonfiction categories of books and slims those books down for you to just 15 minutes of listening or reading. So you get all the key points, no fluff. I've told you about the old, old classics they have, like Machiavelli's The Prince and Seneca on Stoicism, but of course, also a ton of modern books. For example, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. That is perfect for our audience. And then you'll even find on Blinkist Murray Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty. And that's one of the early libertarian books I read that helped put things together for me, that helped me realize that in one area after another, there was a freedom-based answer to what ails us. It's the kind of thing that changes your life when you read it. And that's the kind of title you'll find many of at Blinkist. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, 
Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. You said that you feel somewhat more optimistic about particular political trends than maybe some other people do. What did you mean by that? I mean, I think I know what you mean, but I want to hear you explain it. Well, I think that the quality of, like, there's still, I think if you, you know, if we simplify it down, like the Republican Party and elected leaders, you know, I think the majority of Republicans in Congress are completely worthless, if not outright controlled opposition. Obviously, I am a big DeSantis fan, as sometimes I talk about. But I look at someone like Blake Masters, who last week got the coveted Trump endorsement. And I mean, this is a guy, I mean, I've, I've had a conversation with him. Like, I saw him at an event in December, and he was taking a picture on his phone of anatomy of the state to send to a friend because, like, he thought it was cool that we had this book at an event I was at. We had a conversation. I mean, he says, I didn't quiz him on it, but he says that he read Human Action back in high school, which is just, you know. Okay. And no, whole- I mean, I'm not saying the guy's lying, but I'm saying that if that were true, that would be quite extraordinary. Yes. Yeah. And what's interesting is that you look back, I mean, this guy, he was writing for LRC about anti-war propaganda or uh, making a case against, you know, highlighting the dangers of war propaganda in 2006. By the way, LRC is lourockwell.com yes, yes. for people who don't know the lingo. Yes. In 2006, which is before Ron Paul was cool, right? Like, he's someone who I, I think is just a very interesting figure. And not everyone is that's rising at the ranks is, is a Ron DeSantis or a Blake Masters but I think all it takes is a few of them. And I've talked to congressional offices. I've talked to people that work within what we might call conservative ink in some of the policy shops. There's a very interesting moment on the inflation issue because, again, number one issue in America, there's no political solution being talked about. Republicans will pay lip service to, uh, oh, we're, we're going to cut spending. Yeah, right. You know, I don't think anyone believes that. Republicans in, in D.C. are only good at giving money to the military and getting one tax cut every whenever they have all the strings. I think there is an opportunity, though, within that realm to push something like Ron Paul's old competing currency bill, which is really just eliminating taxes on gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. It doesn't require changing the ideology of the Fed. All it does is cut taxes on people that save outside of the dollar system. I think there's plenty of arguments to be made against the dollar system and, and the regime makes more of them every month. And that's- Well, historic- and of course, get rid of this awful, yeah, definitely what they did to Bitcoin, right. where you have to pay capital gains on it. Right, like that. exactly. Like, I mean, gold and silver, that was one thing, but Bitcoin has real ambitions. And I think some of the Bitcoin people may be over-promised when they said, oh, the state can't stop us. Right. Well, no, they can certainly, they can try and- that IRS rule was very bad. So just interjecting there, because when they did that, I thought the only thing that's going to turn that around is when a lot of congressmen come to hold Bitcoin, and then they suddenly decide they don't want this tax anymore. Yes. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. And it's unfortunate because that rule was doubled down. Like it, it, was, it was expanded during that 2018 tax bill, which I thought on the whole, I was generally pretty good relative to other things. But that was an aspect where they actually made the crypto tax laws even worse in 2018. And so this is something where it only requires 50 plus one votes, right? This isn't a gigantic reform. And I've had very good discussions with staff members of current Congress members, Senate offices, candidates that are leading their races. And again, even some of these old conservative ink policy shops, which themselves kind of find themselves in a a very interesting sort of situation where they're recognizing the sort of populist moment that's there And yet they don't want to give up on sort of, you know, boomer Reagan style free markets, perhaps. But there's an emotional attachment there. They're not going to go like full economic nationalism on this sort of stuff. And so we actually have, for example, at Heritage now, Peter St. Ange, who's a former Mises fellow, has become, you know, one of the top money guys at Heritage. He spoke at an Orlando event that the Institute had a couple of weeks ago. It's again, this is not to say we shouldn't be highly skeptical of any institution in D.C., you know, this does not make up for the Iraq war or anything in the past. I just think that on the margins, we can see some very interesting people either directly from our movement or allies to that movement that are on the uptrend. And that is something that there's a lot of work to do, but it's something that, that I find a white pill while navigating an otherwise very painful environment that the regime has 
put in place for us. If people want to follow you, is Twitter the best place? Yeah, I'm, I'm perhaps most active on, on Twitter these days. But there's one project, if they're interested in sort of this style of monetary content, the Institute just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Mises Institute, the, the, again, Mises just Institute, for the newbies. Yep. M-I-S-E-S dot org. We have a new animated video series based off of Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? I wrote the scripts for that. We have four episodes up there right now. There will be a total of nine after we get them all animated. But that content, you can be found at whathasgovernmentdonetoourmoney.com. And so we're trying to do a lot more short video style types of content out there to kind of make these issues easier to digest for either high school students or for people that are just kind of you know, wanting a better understanding of the economic environment that we have right now. All right, I'll link to these things. The show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 2142. So I'm going to link to what has government done to our money.com and then also to your Twitter, which is simply Tho Bishop. So yes. T-H-O Bishop. And so for you newbies, what that translates into is twitter.com slash Tho Bishop. And even if you are not even if you don't have a Twitter account, you never have any intention of having a Twitter account, you can go to twitter.com slash Tho Bishop and nevertheless see his his feed. Like for instance, sometimes it's fun just to go, not to go to the homepage of Twitter and look through your naturally occurring organic feed, but rather to go directly to somebody's feed and just see what they've been up to. So Michael Malice is a good guy to do that yes. too. Just go right to Michael Malice's feed, just see what he's been up to. Or you go to mine, you know, Thomas E. Woods on Twitter and just see what I'm up to. So check out Tho Bishop, and if you are on Twitter, then definitely go ahead and follow him over there. So the place with both of these links will be tomwoods.com slash 2142. Thanks so much, Tho. Hope to see you sometime. So, well, I guess I will be seeing you very soon. Yes. So thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. All right, everybody, we got a techie topic tomorrow, but a good one about so-called open source, right? We hear this phrase all the time, and we're all too afraid to tell anybody that we have absolutely no idea what it means, but... It, in effect, is based on the ideas of voluntarism that we like. So I think you're going to enjoy the episode next time. And remember, we are not too far away from the next academic year. So think about that self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And if you are thinking about it, then obviously you want to subscribe through me because only through me do you get the bonuses. And the bonuses are my entire Liberty Classroom program, which is dozens of courses. I have a free course on the foundations of Liberty that's aimed at like a young high school audience that I created just for people who get the curriculum through my link. And you also get an autographed copy of the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. These are all free bonuses as long as you get the curriculum through me. So how do you do that? You go to ronpaulhomeschool.com. That's my site. Click on a link and you go order and you are off to the races. So go check that out, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.